Hello, and welcome to Chagpar MD. I'm Dr. Anise Chagpar. Now, a few weeks ago, we had a great conversation with a good friend of mine, Dr. Lajos Pustai, and we were talking about the latest advances in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Now, much of our discussion really focused on medical management, whether that is endocrine therapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, or immunotherapy. And in that video, I kind of mentioned that surgery oftentimes is not part of the management of patients with metastatic disease. Now, some of you may be wondering about the data in that regard, um, because there have been some randomized control trials that look at that. Some of that data is hot off the presses. So I thought I would put all of that information together for you to talk about whether there really is a role for surgery in the setting of metastatic disease. So what do you say? Let's get started. Now, when we think about surgery for metastatic breast cancer, the data are really controversial. But first, I want to set the groundwork. When we're talking here about metastatic breast cancer, we're talking about stage four disease. That is to say, cancer that is spread beyond the breast and the lymph nodes. So whether this is to distant sites like the brain, the bone, the liver, the adrenal glands, the lung, um, any of those other areas where this would not routinely be part of surgical resection. And in this talk specifically, we're talking about whether there is any benefit to removing the primary breast cancer. We're not quite gonna get into whether there's a benefit for resection of the actual metastatic deposit because there's even less data on that. But when we think about surgery of the primary breast cancer in the setting of a patient who has distant metastatic disease, what are the data? Well, historically, we've really had the question of to resect or not to resect. And for the most part, most of us have gone with not to resect. Why? Because this is systemic disease. That disease has already gotten out of the breast and out of the lymph nodes to other distant sites where surgery is not going to touch that disease. And therefore, you cannot render these patients necessarily um, NED or no evidence of disease if they've got distant metastatic spread. In addition, local control carries risk. Um, surgery is not without its complications. And the benefit of resecting the primary tumor if there's still disease in other places is really unclear. Now, what about if you can control the disease in other places? The issue with surgeons has always been, how do you know? How do you know that there isn't still cells that are floating around that still would mean that this patient has a suboptimal prognosis such that surgery may not help? But more recently, a number of people have started thinking about whether there is actually a benefit to resection. Certainly, it does provide local control. And this is the one area where surgery is really indicated even in the setting of metastatic disease. And that is to say, if somebody has distant metastatic disease, but the breast itself is causing a local control problem, whether that's because of bleeding or infection or just a terrible fungating mess, local control can often palliate these symptoms. And some people have argued that with improvements in systemic therapy, um, that it might be possible to render patients NED or no evidence of disease. Others have argued that primary tumor in the breast may harbor stem cells. And so actually resecting this may get rid of this primary nidus, making additional uh, therapy even more effective. And there may be some tumor-induced immunosuppression. So if you get rid of the primary tumor, you may help patients to actually combat their cancer better. The question really was, is there any evidence that primary surgery actually leads to improved survival? 
Now there have been a number of retrospective studies that have been done. And here I show you a meta-analysis that was done in 2016, which really seems to suggest that there is a benefit for primary surgery. But wait a minute. Remember, all of these studies are done retrospectively. And that means that there was a certain amount of forethought that went into surgical decision-making. Are these patients really people that we think would benefit from primary surgery versus all comers? Certainly, the similar findings are seen when we look at SEER, which is one of our national uh, data sets collecting information on cancer patients. And you can see here, that whether you look at overall survival or breast cancer specific survival, the group who had surgery did better than the group who did not. But is this just selection bias? Clearly, we may be offering patients surgery when they have limited other disease, when that disease is well controlled, um, and when we actually think that we can make a benefit. But does this hold throughout for all patients? The only way to really answer that question is through randomized control trials. And thankfully, there are a number of them. Now, I will be showing you data from the first three in this table, the Indian trial, the Turkish trial, and the ECOG trial, which was done in the US and Canada. All three of these have now been published. There was a trial in Austria, which is now closed to accrual. The Japanese trial is still recruiting and hopes to uh, have data to present to us in May of uh, 2022. Um, the study from the Netherlands and from Thailand terminated early um, due to poor accrual and limited events. But let's dig into the actual trial data that we have to see if we can glean some information as to the question of whether primary surgery actually improves survival. Now, the first um, study that was published was the one uh, from India that was published in Lancet Oncology in 2015 by Badway and colleagues. Um, this randomized uh, 716 patients uh, with metastatic disease, 350 were randomized, 173 got local regional treatment, 177 did not. There was a median follow-up of 23 months, and over that period of time, what they found was that there was no difference in overall survival. Clearly, however, the patients who had local regional therapy had a significantly lower rate of local regional progression, um, and so uh, were much more likely uh, to survive without local regional spread. Interestingly, however, those who did receive surgery had a higher rate of distant uh, um, uh, progression and therefore um, had a lower uh, distant progression free survival. Now, the reasons for this are not entirely clear, and the authors speculate that this may have been due to tumor seeding and dislodgement into the circulation with surgery. Suffice it to say that we really don't have the answer as to why this occurred, but it is an interesting finding that only highlights the fact that surgery itself is not necessarily the be all and end all when it comes to uh, control of distant disease in patients with metastatic cancer. Now the Turkish trial had a, a different design and we'll talk about the differences between these trials momentarily. They took 312 patients with metastatic disease, randomized 274, 138 had local regional therapy plus systemic therapy, 136 had systemic therapy alone. Now of note, in the Turkish trial, the patients were treated with surgery first before systemic therapy um, versus in the Indian trial, they were given a regimen of systemic therapy first uh, and then randomized uh, into either getting local regional therapy uh, versus no additional treatment. Now, in this study, with a median follow-up of 55 months, they analyzed the data in two uh, segments. 
Their initial publication, which reported data at three years, found that the overall survival rate was no different. However, the five-year overall survival rate was significantly worse in the systemic therapy alone group in the sense that local regional therapy seemed to confer a significant improvement in five-year overall survival. And like the Indian trial, and what would we would surmise commonsensically, um, the patients who had surgery had a much lower rate of local regional recurrence. Now, the Turkish trial also had some unplanned subset analyses where they really tried to look at which particular patients may benefit the most from surgery versus not. And they found that this was the case for patients who were ERPR positive, HER2 negative, who were younger, who may have solitary bone only disease. And so these might be criteria that surgeons were applying uh, at the get-go when we looked at those retrospective studies as well. Now, what happened in the ECOG 2108 trial? This trial uh, had 390 patients. All of them received optimal systemic therapy for four to eight um, months. Um, those who did not progress uh, then were eligible for randomization. 256 were randomized, 125 to uh, then receive local regional therapy, 131 to have optimal systemic therapy alone. Here, the uh, follow-up period was 53 months. And you can see here the three-year overall survival um, was no different between the two groups. Now, again, the three-year local regional recurrence rate was significantly better in the group randomized to local regional therapy. Interestingly, they also found differences in terms of subtype in the sense that um, while there was no difference in the HER2 positive group or in the uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative group, in 20 patients who had triple negative disease, early local therapy seemed to result in worse overall survival. They also looked at quality of life because clearly that's another thing to look at in addition to simply looking at overall survival and recurrence. And interestingly here, when they looked at quality of life as assessed by the FACT-B trial outcome index, there was no difference at most time points. And interestingly, local therapy was associated with a significantly worse quality of life at 18 months. Now again, we need to compare all of these trials. Certainly, the Indian trial and the ECOG trial found no benefit in terms of overall survival. All three trials did find a benefit for local regional therapy, as one would expect. They were different, however, in the number of years that they had follow-up. So certainly, the Turkish and the ECOG trials had longer follow-up than the Indian trial. In terms of uh, line of therapy, both the Indian trial and the ECOG trial uh, treated patients with systemic therapy up front. Those who responded or, or at least didn't progress were then eligible for randomization to either surgery or not. In the Turkish trial, however, all patients uh, were randomized to either surgery or systemic therapy alone. So patients who were given surgery, uh, that was their primary modality. You can see that the median age of the patients was roughly similar across all groups, slightly younger in the Indian trial, slightly older in the ECOG trial. Um, Bone-only metastases, again, uh, about a third in the Indian trial, almost half in the Turkish trial. The um, proportion of patients who had HER2 positive disease was roughly similar in all three groups. However, the Indian trial, um, only roughly a quarter of the patients actually were treated with trastuzumab, which was one of the factors um, when the Turkish trial came out that suggested that the Indian trial patients may have been suboptimally treated 
for their systemic therapy. However, the difference between uh, overall survival between the Indian trial and the ECOG trial being equivalent makes one think that that could not have been the whole story. Certainly the ECOG patients who were well treated with trastuzumab in the main still had no overall survival benefit. How do we put all of this data together? Clearly there are conflicting data. However, when we take all of these factors together, there are at least two randomized control trials now that seem to suggest that surgery really is not of benefit necessarily in patients who have metastatic disease. There is a benefit, however, for local control and certainly for palliation of symptoms where indicated. This continues to be an area that evolves and we're looking forward to more and more data. But I hope that this video has been helpful for you, at least in understanding where we are right now with regards to the state of the science. I hope this video has been helpful for you. I hope that you'll like, share, and subscribe. Please let your friends know about our channel um, and make sure that you all tune in. We're trying to build a community geared around evidence-based health and wellness. If there are other topics that you would like covered, please let me know. I would be delighted to oblige. Until next time, I'm Dr. Anise Chagpar wishing you all a safe and healthy week.